Hi everyone, I'm Archer from Multi, and today we're going to be talking about ThorChain. So at a glance, ThorChain is a decentralized permissionless network that allows the swapping of digital assets such as BTC, ETH, BNB, and so on by continuous liquidity pools. Basically, it's a cross-chain Uniswap with its own native token where liquidity providers create pools of BTC rune, ETH rune, BNB rune that allow you to swap between these cross-chain assets. They also earn rewards for doing this. The network is secured by anonymous nodes that create vaults and validate incoming outgoing transactions. The, and the network token rune is used in the liquidity pools and is bonded by the nodes. This also serves an important security function. So as I mentioned, Rune is the network token, which needs to be bonded by the nodes, as well as staked into each of the asset pools. So, and for optimal security, the value of Rune bonded by the nodes should always be twice the value of Rune staked into the liquidity pools. So this, the logic here is that the reward from compromising the network needs to be smaller than the uh, investment required to compromise the, the network. How is ThorChain not restricted by chains? So ThorChain connects to the networks uh, via one-way state pegs. This means that the assets are not pegged on the network, just the state of the transactions on the corresponding network. So for example, the BTC network or ETH. Uh, the nodes basically listen to each connected chain's transactions and only ThorChain related transactions are synced by the nodes. So for example, if you wanna swap uh, BTC to BNB. Uh, so your BTC never gets locked to the network. The node simply listens to the, uh, to the uh, Bitcoin network and broadcasts that I saw someone send one BTC to the ThorChain BTC vault. And the vault being essentially the wallet where the, uh, where the liquidity pool is held. Um, after that, the nodes send BNB to your BNB wallet from the ThorChain BNB vault. So as I mentioned, the, the close comparison to ThorChain is uh, Uniswap. Uh, however, there are some, uh, main, uh, some main differences. Uh, so Uniswap runs on a proof, a proof of work consensus algorithm, uh, namely Ethereum. Uh, ThorChain is a proof of stake network uh, using the Cosmos SDK. Uh, Uniswap does not have an, a native token, which means that the value creation technically is built around ETH. ThorChain uh, has its own network to token root. Uh, Uniswap supports uh, ETH and ERC20. Uh, ThorChain, on the other hand, uh, supports uh, BNB, BTC, and the entire vision is for it to be completely cross-chain. Uniswap uh, will be able to support cross-chain uh, cross tokens. However, this will be done by a wrapped token solution, solutions such as uh, REN. Um, in terms of stages, Uniswap has been, uh, is probably the, one of the most famous DEXs and has been tremendously successful. They've been live for over one and a half years. And, um, and as of today, there's around between 40 to 50 million uh, staked into various pools. Uh, Re uh, ThorChain is expe uh, expected to launch its main net in June, July, uh, 2020. Now, a major difference between Uniswap and ThorChain is, uh, is the pool logic. So Uniswap uh, notably uh, uses the XYK uh, formula, which is, uh, which is uh, originally ideated by Vitalik Buterin and it essentially assumes a constant value of uh, both of the pool assets. Uh, now this poses a slight problem because uh, for example, how it works is that you have, you had a thousand, there always needs to be an equal value of both assets in the pool. So for example, you add 1000 DAI into the pool and, one, and 10 ETH worth $100. But now when, uh, when ETH goes to 120, then essentially what happens is that the 1000 uh, DAI still remains, but there will no longer be 10 ETH there, but a thousand dollar equivalent of ETH. Uh, and in a trending market, this causes an effect called impermanent loss, which basically means that the liquidity providers have, have had a hypothetical loss versus if they would have simply held the asset. And uh, this is, uh, ThorChain on the other hand, uses uh, uh, an approach called continuous liqui uh, liquidity pool, uh, which incorporates a slip-based fee. 
Uh, and this slip-based fee means that uh, traders are penalized for causing a slip, uh, for causing a larger slippage. So for example, if my trade um, causes a 3% slippage uh, in this particular pool, I would be paying a higher fee than, for example, if, it, if I would have caused a 1% slippage. And uh, uh, another case is that Uniswap's uh, fee, a flat fee model makes it... Uh, relatively prone to uh, to price manipulation. So neither of them of the, uh, of the protocols require uh, an Oracle. However, Uniswap's fee model makes it essentially uh, quite cheap to manipulate it, its prices, whereas the slip based fee aims to make it uh, considerably more expensive to, uh, for, a, for a bad actor to manipulate. So Thorchain's network consists of three participants. There's the users, the liquidity providers, and the nodes. So users, they exchange different cross-chain assets between the pools and pay a corresponding slip-based fee. As I mentioned, the slip-based fee penalizes those looking for a fast execution with a higher fee. And uh, the fee is also used uh, to cover the gas costs on external networks for the nodes. Uh, and it must be noted that the entire swapping process is non-custodial, permissionless, and is technically not uh, restricted to any chain. Liquidity providers uh, stake assets into various pools. Each pool is, uh, uh, is in a separate one with uh, PEG2 Rune, and each asset is held uh, in, in vaults. The key feature of uh, liquidity pools is also that, as I mentioned, that it doesn't require a price fee, so there's no Oracle problem. And uh, for this, the uh, liquidity providers earn rewards depending on the fees generated by the particular pools uh, they've staked into. And the liquidity rewards are paid out when the assets are withdrawn from the pool. So now the nodes, uh, which is the most complex part. The anonymous nodes carry three purposes. So firstly, they bond rune to qualify as a node. Uh, today, it, uh, it requires 1 million rune to qualify as a node, which is around 100,000 uh us dollars worth and most importantly rune cannot be delegated so similar to uh so for example unlike eos where nodes uh or block producers essentially uh, communicate and uh stay and the staking can be delegated in rune's case this can't be done uh nodes also they create vaults which are essentially the wallets where the pool uh, pools, pools are held and they witness transactions, which is uh, they produce blocks. And uh, another interesting part is that the nodes naturally get cycled or turned every couple of days in order to constantly renew the network. So this means that older nodes get kicked out automatically, but this is, this is not, there's nothing wrong with this. They can simply cycle themselves back in, but for this, they need to update their, uh, their software to the latest version. So this ensures that the network is constantly updating itself. The network economics. So the network participants are rewarded from distribution of the system income. And the system income is made up of swap fees and block rewards. Swap fees are the are the same slip based fees that are paid for uh, by the users for uh, for exchanging the assets. Block rewards are distributed based on the emission schedule from a pre a pre allocated reserve. Um, so by default, the system income is distributed according to the same 67 uh, 33 percent uh, ratio that ensures the optimal network security. However, the actual uh, ratio is governed by something called the incentive pendulum. So the incentive pendulum is uh, basically what it does is that it aims to uh, maintain or reach this optimal 67-33 split. Uh, so for example, if there is uh, above optimal amount of rune bonded in the nodes, then a larger portion of system income goes to the liquidity providers to bring the ratio back to optimal, and the same happens vice versa. Um, so the total supply of Rune is 500 million tokens, of which 100 million was sold to the public in three stages, and uh, 150 million has been allocated between uh, reserves for the team community as well as operations. And another 220 million is in the emission reserve, reserved for the block rewards. Uh, it also must be noted that the initial su the total supply was a, was a billion tokens, but in October 2019, the team decided to reduce uh, or burn half of the supply 
uh, using all the reserve or using the reserves and the seed allocation. So this means that the public uh, publicly sold tokens were not affected. Um, so the emission schedule, 44% uh, of the supply or 220 million tokens has been set aside to be emitted over six years with one sixth of the remaining total being emitted every year after the mainnet launch. Uh, the network aims to emit uh, again, two thirds to the nodes and one third to the liquidity providers. However, the real distribution is covered by the incentive pendulum. Mm. So, uh, Thorchain aims to have minimal governance, uh, unlike other protocols where nodes, for example, communicate each other and coordinate and so on. Uh, new assets get listed by creating a new pool with that asset. So, for example, if there's a, an ERC20 token that, uh, that does not have an existing uh, liquidity pool uh, on Thorchain, I can simply send this asset in and it creates what is called, it becomes what is called a bootstrapped pool. Uh, now this bootstrap pool uh, is not uh, so you can't other customers can't swap with this pool, but you can send assets in and every couple of days, the biggest or deepest bootstrap pool is enabled uh, for uh, for real trading. So this kind of um, ensures that the the most liquid assets are add uh, are constantly listed, but that ultimately basically any asset uh, will be listed. And uh, adding new chains is a slightly longer process because uh, every new chain requires the writing of new code, uh, which requ requires uh, some review from the core devs. Uh, but once it's proved, then uh, essentially 67% of the nodes uh, need to be running this particular uh, software. Uh, so, uh, which is when, where this, uh, the no churning or cycling comes in, because essentially once a new, once new software is approved, then it's only a matter of time. Once enough nodes have been churned through and they've had to manual, uh, they've had to update their software. Um, so a little history about Rune, it was started in 2018. The team is semi-anonymous, uh, and, uh, they, to sort of with the goal to, um, I guess, prevent this sort of, um, Jesus, Jesus effect that uh, some other uh, blockchains have um, have suffered from. Um, they've raised a total of three rounds, uh, as well as some OTC sales of, uh, of operational tokens, uh, which is which is also uh, which had been pre-planned. Uh, the total amount we we uh, we estimate to be less than three million dollars. Uh, uh, on top of that, they're, they have incredibly transparent weekly development updates, as well as monthly treasury reports and so on. And uh, their GitHub, GitHub is also very active. So this is uh, one example of their uh, monthly treasury reports where they not only they share the balances um, of, uh, of each asset, they also share information around past OTC sales, if they've made changes to the OTC strategy, if there's any upcoming large ticket expenses and generally what the runway is. Uh, so as of May 2020, the team has around 20, uh, two years runway left. Um, where's room going? Where is it now? So the Binance chain test net and chaos nets are live uh, and they're currently undergoing uh, core uh, audits of the three uh, core components, which are expected to finish in May 2020. So some of these audits are complete and some of them are, are still uh, remaining. After the audits, they're expected to, uh, to launch the mainnet um, with initial support for Binance chain and then to be followed by ETH and BTC connections. However, the team has kind of signaled that uh, because the audits uh, have, there's been some delays with the audits, then a BTC peg might actually be there uh, upon launch as well. But this is, uh, this is not like an act actual confirmation yet. Um, in terms of potential risks and criticism, um, so it's still a pre-launch project. So uh, there's still a sort of general risk that it simply doesn't work out and something unexpected happens. Um, there's also been some criticism around the team's affiliation with some uh, other previous projects, uh, as well as uh, some ICOs. And uh, generally, the sort of uh, the documentation around Thorchain is a bit fragmented, and there's no official white paper. Which is, uh, but uh, their justification for this is that they prefer the uh, the current sort of uh, they prefer the flexibility, and the, an official white paper will be released once uh, once the mainnet launches. Um, so to sum up, why do we need Thorchain? Um, 
So an interoperable decentralized exchange allows for completely new use cases in DeFi because the current decentralized exchanges are essentially are only limited to their respective blockchains and can't uh, essentially can't talk to each other. Um, if you want to uh, learn more about uh, Thorchain, then I suggest joining their communities, uh, which you speak to the team on Telegram, follow them on Twitter. They have very active GitHub as well. They pub regularly publish content on Medium and Reddit is also quite active. Um, about uh, Briefly about Multi. So Multi is an upcoming exchange focused on listing high quality altcoins that are under the radar. Um, we're a margin first exchange with uh, spot and margin trading as well as peer to peer lending. Uh, we create uh, in depth research and uh, host regular events with industry participants and projects, and we, uh, we have a strict no uh, listing fee policy as well. 